doesn't love dancing? What about dancing with other people? What about dancing with other people for prizes? For hours and hours and hours and sometimes even days and days and days. The sadistic world of depression era dance marathons. This week on This Was a Thing. Oh, I'm thinking so fondly of mid-Atlantic accents and goldfish swallowing. Oh, the joy that I feel thinking of the New Deal and the Hayes Code. This was a thing. I can't get my mind off those fireside chats and the music of Ruth and Ing. Jesse Owens could run, Greta Garbo had fun. And sweet Charlie Temple could sing All these things and more were a thing Hi, I'm Ray. And I'm Rob. And you're listening to This Was a Thing, the podcast that dives deep into the cultural happenings of yesteryear. On today's episode, we are looking at dance marathons. Oh. Yes. Get out your dancing shoes, Francis. This was a thing because these marathons are really the beginnings of reality television. Yes. Oh. During the 1930s, if you wanted to see couples get together and break up, watch people lie, cheat, and steal their way to a cash prize, or just simply if you wanted to enjoy watching people more miserable than you, you had to go on down to your local dance dance hall to see the first quote-unquote reality shows now in their heyday dance marathons were among america's most widely attended and controversial forms of live entertainment the business employed about twenty thousand people as promoters masters of ceremonies floor judges trainers nurses and contestants which one of those do you think you would have been, Mr. Hebel? MC all the way, baby. Hello, welcome to the dance marathon. <laughs> Let me. Can I hear some color commentary, please, about what's happening on the dance floor? Ooh, if you look at Pippi over there, she's going to do a two-step, and then look at Johnny Boy Walkie. Oh, boy, he's doing the Charleston faster than anyone from Charleston, and I've been to Charleston, and I've seen Charleston done fast, and Johnny Boy Walkie there is, he is the fastest boy I've ever seen. Johnny Boy is one of those great legends of the dance floor, because Johnny loves both his arms and his legs in World War I, but a proud man in the American spirit, nothing has stopped him. In fact, Johnny Boy died in 1926, and he still shows up to dance every single day. Funny thing about Johnny Boy, the term he burnt up the dance floor actually comes from him because he combusted on the dance floor. That's right, Johnny caught fire. I believe it's something that had to do with the Agent Orange when he was overseas during World War I. Anyway, he is the man. Even though Johnny has passed away, he is still here every day. Let's see those dirty Germans do that. <laughs> that was very patriotic. All right. So, first of all, in order to get some understanding of why these dance marathons even occurred and why they were a thing, we have to go back a little bit. We're think, think of Victorian era. Think of the late 1800s. Oh, you want me to go all the way back? <laughs> so, in the as Ray is saying, in the Victorian age, dancing was around, but most people looked at it as sinful, and any sort of dancing was always done with like people facing each other, but also 400 <laughs> feet apart. Or you could do like a polka, where we can kind of touch, but we have to leave room for the Holy Spirit. The thing about the Holy Spirit is... It's German and loves a polka. Now, it's for a couple of reasons back then, because number one, you have to remember that people did not want uh, genital, no no bumping hips. Uh, no, bumping no, hip. no bumping hips at the Steel Pier dance marathon. That is the Johnny Carson apparently has made an appearance on today's podcast. But also, remember, ladies, you were wearing hoop skirts at the time, so it was hard to get close even if you wanted to. Now, this is all going to change when we meet a couple that we don't really remember so much today, but when I was doing my research on them, I found them absolutely fascinating. Their names were Vernon and Irene Castle, and they wrote a book. The book is called Modern Dancing. They literally wrote the book on dancing. They were a married couple that were engaged in partner dancing in countless Broadway musicals throughout the 1910s. And because of their dancing, they revived things like the Foxtrot or the Handless Tango. This is where we would tango, but we would keep our arms behind one another. Oh, I thought it was a dance that was teaching inclusivity. <laughs> it's not a Handless Tango. <laughs> the reason that the people loved the castle so much is because they were very wholesome in their approach. And so they made partner dancing look respectable. So even though we don't 
don't really know them today, they started the trend of saying, hey, you can dance with a partner. It's okay. It doesn't always mean that it has to be sexual. Also, this Irene Castle, she was kind of a trendsetter because she was the one who was like, hey, women need shorter, fuller skirts. And she was like, hey, I need to move around a little bit when I'm dancing. So she advocated for looser and elasticized corsets. You know what else she did? What? She was like, hey, ladies, how about we bob our hair? Because it's 1922. Any Thoroughly Modern Millie fans out there? All right. And they were progressive in other ways. They traveled with a black orchestra, and their manager was an openly lesbian individual. <laughs> Look at the castles. Sadly, Vernon died in a plane crash in 1919, but Irene kept on dancing. He died in a 1919 plane crash? Yes. That was like the very early days of plane travel. Like, I wonder, like, in the infancy days of plane testing, like, how many plane crashes there were and how many deaths from just, like, <laughs> like from all the people just going, like, let's try it. Okay, uh, whose turn is it? Okay, who got the short straw? Vernon? <laughs> this time we're going to see what happens if we take out one of the engines. <laughs> Vernon? Uh, come on, Vernon, get in the cockpit. Let's look at the old bits again today. Oh, another planey, another planey. Tuberculosis, oh. another planey. Oh, wow, at least the TB oh. got in there. No, he died of TB on the plane. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So the ni- <laughs> the 1920s comes around, and as we know, the 1920s is a time where we have a lot of endurance crazes, because the Olympics had happened a few decades before. People were like, I want to see how long I can endure. <laughs> Here's some endurance things that maybe we can try to bring back. Oh. Goldfish swallowing. Oh, absolutely. Kissing, how long you could kiss. Oh, I've done that before. I was 13. Six-day bicycle races. You had to continuously bike for six days, no sleep. Keep going. I've done seven, so I could probably do that. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Fucking I own the 20s. Look at my fucking thighs. Oh, I can see that. Good for you, man. And one that I think, Ray, I think you experimented with a little bit when you were a younger guy, pole sitting. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> pole sitting. Is that where that song Flag Pole Sitter comes from? Absolutely. <laughs> from the 1920s. <laughs> anyway, so anyone has these endurance crazes, and then there's a woman in New York named Alma Cummings, and she's like, I got an endurance craze for all of you. And then she's like, ooh, look at that guy, Alma Cummings. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Alma. She says, I'm going to be able to dance continuously. And she did for 27 hours with six different partners. So after she established this record of like dancing continuously for 27 hours, dance marathons start to become common around the United States. And they're like, can you break Alma's record? Within three weeks, they were able to break yeah. Alma's record. So originally they were called walkathons huh. because they were like, if we call them dance-a-thons, people are going to know we're dancing and it's sinful. So they called them a walkathon. And originally what happened was the walkathon was just continuously walking in a circle without stopping. And whoever didn't drop dead by the end got a prize. They also called them bunion derbies. Oh! Oh, God. Or, you ready for this one? Corn and callous carnivals. So originally, the participants like got into these things because they wanted to break Alma's record. But later on, they were like, can we sort of win prizes? And so you could, you could get some money for doing something like this. All of these things, the pole sitting, the goldfish swallowing, the dance marathons, were all fun. It was all fun and games until Black Tuesday when the stock market crashes. And now at the Depression, people are hungry and they're homeless and they're eager for food and a quick buck, and a warm place, and that's where the dance marathon turns sadist. Because <laughs> the dance marathon is totally aware of what's going on with everybody in the world, and they're like, we'll give you some food, we'll give you shelter. Here's the thing, though. You gotta dance until you fall down and collapse. And people said... Yes. Yes. All right? <laughs> so here's what you need, folks, if you, if you want to do your own dance marathon from the 1930s, if this is a fun activity for you to do now that you're out of quarantine. The first thing you need is a marathon promoter. Now, the marathon promoter, I want you to think of this all in like terms of reality television, okay? The marathon promoter, this is the producer of the event. So his job is, is he hires the MC, he hires the judges, and together, the MC and the judges would choose pretty much who the winner was going to be sure, and who the finalists were going to be and what angles would be the most dramatic. Because the MC would like, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, but the MC would tell people, hey, look at couple number seven. Let me tell you their story. Johnny came back from war and would like build up sympathy. You have to think of somebody like Mark Burnett. Like okay. Mark Burnett is the producer of all this, okay? And the big thing the producer's job also was to do was to find something called virgin spot. What do you think the virgin spot is in dance marathons? A, a part of the floor that's never been touched? Oh, that's really interesting. I never thought of that. No, a virgin spot was a town where a marathon had not yet been done. 
because the people there were easier to fool. That makes sense. A lot of these producers also looked for virgin spots because they would often skip town without paying their bills. Of course they would. So that was another thing. So they're going to take your money and then not pay you. They also, one of the things the promoters did to try to make it feel like the dancing was, you know, honest and legitimate was they tried to get local sponsors to be a part of it, but noble local sponsors like the veterans of foreign wars or the American Legion. And that was like, hey, look, we're respectable because the foreign legion is sponsoring us. You think we can get the elks? (laughs) I can't get the elks. I can get the mooses. Then there would be, I think, your job. This would be the MC, And the MC was the one who would like tell everyone the stories of people on the dance floor. He would announce it to the crowds, but he was also malicious because he would change the tempo of the songs and confuse the players and exhaust them. So he would be like, all right, band, let's play five fast songs. And then out of nowhere, he'd be like, slow it. So to me, I kind of <laughs> think of this is like Jillian on The Biggest Loser, like kind of sadistic and oh, malicious yeah. as she's <laughs> forcing Jillian people to and, do things. And Bob. Now, here's the job I think I would want. There were what was known as floor judges, and a floor judge would walk around to make sure people never stopped moving, and if they did stop moving, they would be disqualified. So in these dance marathons, you could never stop moving. And if you did, how did they wake you up? They had a switch. And they'd hit you in the kneecaps as hard as possible with the switch to wake you back up. All of these dance marathons mean a not if there is not an audience to be there. So an audience, then we have to remember, this is the depression. An audience would pay a quarter and they would be allowed to watch the dance marathon for as long as they wanted. So remember, you're indoors, it's warm, and most importantly, you can watch people more miserable than you, (laughs) which I think is why reality TV was so big during quarantine. And before quarantine. And before quarantine. And after quarantine. My life is sad, but at least I'm not honey boo boo. Or even just like, I mean, the housewives. I love the housewives, but they have money. Oh, but same. It's not no, as same. crazy. Same. So women made up about 75% of these dance marathon audiences, and they became really involved in like the emotional storylines the MCs were creating. And so they came to follow the stories of the characters, except the characters were actual real people. Kind of like what we're going to see in like soap operas. Yeah, I was, I was on just going to say yeah. like soap opera. And the MCs would spin like really sad stories. Like he'd be like, "Look at that married couple over there. They're dancing because they need prize money to feed their ten children." I would love like the pre-interview of all the contestants. <laughs> like you know, there's like that oh, associate yes. producer. <laughs> yeah. Tell me a story. <laughs> Tell me about your travel here. What was that like? How did you get here? Oh, you took six trains, eh? Oh, you had to leave your kids with your parents, but your parents are dead, so you just left them at the cemetery. Oh, okay. <laughs> ah, they're being babysit by a branch. Ah, okay, that makes sense. All right, everyone, <laughs> let's look at this couple. They took 17 trains here and walked. <laughs> through the snow (laughs) all right so the contestants mostly would be like local people that were just they just wanted to win some money but sprinkled like throughout were professional amateur dancers oh my god that were either hired by the judges yeah or they pretended like oh i've never i don't know anything about dancing and then we'll like get out there like jitterbug for 42 hours oh so like a rob schneider yeah that's what i would do that's exactly what i would do oh i've never done this before hold on here's a little clip from a 1931 dance marathon ladies and gentlemen i'd like to have you meet one of the original couples here in the white city ballroom marathon in chicago that started on august the 30th of last year frankie wagner and buddy plasky how do you feel frankie Oh, I feel pretty tired, and that's uh, going about five months, why? Well, how's Buddy? I'll wake her up and say a few words. Buddy? Buddy? <laughs> wake up! Hey, what month is this? Oh, I guess it's January, about 26th. She's literally about to collapse, and the interviewer, the fucking Ryan Seacrest of the 1930s, goes over to ask how they're doing. She's literally dead. I don't think they're doing too well. Do you think that interviewer was like, Cochrane out! They stopped to talk to me, disqualify them! Uh. So, the ground rules for a dance marathon. First of all, it has to be in a large indoor space, so they use lots of like indoor ballrooms and stuff. The Steel Pier in Atlantic City was also a really popular place for this. Now, going to these places is great in the wintertime, Right? Sure. Because it's freezing outside, so yeah. you can stay warm. But what about the summer when you're dancing for 24 hours straight and there's no air conditioning? Air conditioning. No air conditioning. Yeah. Sorry, folks. You were guaranteed 12 meals a day. 12 meals a day for one person? For one person. And remember, well, we're talking about like a 24 hour period. No, yeah. But here's the issue you can't stop dancing when you eat. You have to be eating and dancing 
at the same time. Huh. And you remember, like, 12 meals a day during the Great Depression was, like, a powerful way to get people in. Yeah. Like, I, I, I can stand up for another apple. The prize, if you won, if you won, was 325 bucks, which is, like, $4,500 today. Jesus. So it's nice, but, you know, what were your medical bills after this? Now, we have a couple of ground rules for the contest, folks. Please, please, listen up, folks. Please listen. Remember, there'll be a sign above your da- the dancers, and it ticks up the hours and tick down the number of contestants remaining. We've been dancing for 27 hours, and we have six couples on the floor. We've been dancing for 32 hours, and we have four couples on the floor. The contest will go as long as a couple was on the floor, with some of them going as long as 20 days. 20 days? Oh, and you're going to hear longer in a little bit. Like, do they get, like... Pee pee and poo poo breaks? What a great question. We'll be getting to that. Calm down, you German. <laughs> Contestants who danced in pairs, you have to remain in motion the entire time. And motion for them is defined as picking up one foot and then the other. And we would they would go 45 minutes for each hour around the clock. Then you would have a 15 minute break. Got it. Where you could go pee pee poo poo. Got it. <laughs> if you want to make some extra money, folks, don't forget you can partner with a local business and advertise on your clothing, sort of like NASCAR. Yeah. Right? And then a lot of the competitors developed like signature songs or comic routines. Oh, and, Jesus Christ. And when they would perform these things, if the audience liked it, they would have what was called silver showers. That's where the audience would throw money and coins at these people. Now, there were also professional comics that were there. They didn't dance. They entertained the crowd. That could also be a good job for you. Now, if you're a contestant, you're expected to dance full out during the heavily attended evening hours. Give these people a show, goddammit. There was a live band that played at night but in the morning and afternoon when they're dancing put on the photograph <laughs> the band got to go home did the MCs have did they like take shifts or did they stay for like the whole 32 hours or whatever I would ass- that's actually a great question I would assume that the MC probably took shifts yeah right yeah because I, I couldn't imagine the MC staying up this late yeah. as well they're not getting paid enough for this so okay so how do they tell these exhausted people <laughs> that there's going to be a 15 minute break well they blast an air horn <laughs> oh Jesus Christ they blast an air horn at these poor poor people it's like a stock market right so then what happens is the contestants then got to exit the dance floor and they went off to these curtained off rest areas that were filled with cots and the rest areas are segregated by sex, right? Mm-hmm. So contestants had started to train themselves that they were able to like drop instantly into a deep sleep as soon as their bodies touched the cot. And after 11 minutes, so it's not a full 15, the air horn would blow again to be like, get back on the floor. And all these people would then like rush back onto the floor. If there was a female contestant who was still asleep after they blew the air horn after 11 minutes, don't worry. They would have smelling salts on hand to revive her. And they would also have tubs of ice water to dunk the heads in of the male contestants. Is, is there any like reports of how many people would show up to these things? Thousands. Thousands, just thousands. depending on the space. Yeah, depending on the space. But thousands of people would show up to these things. That's insane. What did it cost to participate in nothing it. nothing okay but then they made their money off of the audience yeah i mean they made their money the uh, the goal was to win the big prize yeah to stick but, through that but the but i'm saying the promoters made most of their money like they made a lot of money off the audience so there wasn't like oh, a participation yeah. fee or anything, no an no no, no. Yeah. they needed these people yeah out sure there. yeah of course now going so many hours without sleep how does that happen you can actually sleep on the dance floor. So one partner would just support the other one's weight. And the carrier in a couple often would tie the sleeping partner's wrists together with a handkerchief and then hook them around their neck. Listen up. If your knee touches the floor, immediate disqualification. Get out of here. What if I'm doing the knee to the floor? Get out. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you question me. That's my signature move. Did you hear this dirty foreigner from Oregon, what he said? I've got the need of the floor, I'll tell you. It's going to be a new craze up in Portland. <laughs> and so this is where if your knee started to go towards the floor, that's where the floor judge would come out and hit you <laughs> to get your legs back up. Now, in extreme cases, partners quite often would fasten each other together with dog chains. So that way they didn't drift apart. Oh, so it was one of those kind of clubs. Now, how can you make a little bit more money 
on these events if you're a promoter. Well, and I think this is where like reality TV starts to get some of their ideas. If you paid some extra money, you could go to the area where medical treatment was done in full view. Jesus. So they took down all the curtains if you paid an extra couple of coins and you could watch them. Look at that. Look at them fixing those bleeding legs. <laughs> oh boy, that bunion is so bloody. There were also things called cot nights, C-O-T, cot nights. And that's where they would take the beds from the rest area and they would just pull them out into public view so the audience could watch the contestants sleep and like watch them in their most intimate private moments. This is Big Brother. Wow. The more things like that the marathons had, obviously the more people would come because they would want to see these people like sleeping and bleeding everywhere. There, oh, there was also something called Frozen Alive. Oh, Jesus. This is where they would, <laughs> a contestant was frozen in a block of ice. And everyone was like, how does this happen? It's literally a trick. It's like a thing cut a nice thing cut in half. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These people didn't know any different. <laughs> Imagine David Copperfield, these people. My God! Oh my God! The Statue of Liberty's gone! He stole it! <laughs> He's from Canada! It must be those eyebrows of his. Hey, friends. Hope you're enjoying the show. If you are, could you do us a favor? After you listen to today's episode, open up your podcast app and leave us a review, please. The more reviews we get, the more people will discover us, and the more people that discover us, the less lost we'll feel. You're good, buddy. It's okay. Uh, uh, look, nothing has ever been easier to do. Just go ahead and grab a pen real quick. It's okay. We'll wait. Don't worry. Okay. Head on over to your podcast app. Click those three dots in the lower right-hand corner. Click Go to Show. Scroll down till you see ratings and reviews, then leave us some stars and a comment or two so our parents know that it was worth all the tuition that they spent. And if you really love us, head on over to Patreon.com and send us some money, and in return, you will get access to merch, special episodes, bonus content, pictures of me shirtless. Okay, okay, that's P A T. R-E-O-N dot com. Search This Was a Thing and help us out. But you know what? You've already helped us out today by listening to us, and we can't tell you how much we appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you. Then the best is on these things called endurance nights. They would say, okay, we're you don't get breaks. There's no medical attention. You can't go to the bathroom. And the music's just going to be really, really, really fast. Oh, my God. Eventually, like, on these endurance nights, people would just get, like, squirrely. And so the contestants would start hallucinating. Or they would get hysterical. Sometimes, this is, I was like, this is really fucked up. They would be so out of it while on the dance floor, they acted out daily rituals. So, like, they would talk to an imaginary companion. Or they would, like, go to grab their milk bottle from the refrigerator except there is no refrigerator and there is no milk bottle but this is what the audience has lived for when an, when a contestant starts to go squirrely the audience is like it's happening it's happening what's my favorite part about reality tv when people go squirrely yes some of the dancers were like hey listen i've got some ideas and they would do these things they would do tricks so like they could shave the guy would shave his face and the woman would wear like a mirror so he could see how he was shaving so they were dancing dancing with somebody who's holding a razor and hasn't been to sleep for five days this is a fantastic idea folks sometimes they would write letters on a special folding desk that hung around their neck these things are fun but when attendance would drop the promoters then began to like the final push of the what we call elimination events which we see on television oh, absolutely. all the time so the big elimination event was something called a grind a grind was a dance marathon where there was continuous dancing with no rest periods. It literally continued until one or more couples fell and then were disqualified, literally grinding them down in exhaustion. And anything you would do to keep your partner awake in a normal dance marathon, like slapping them across the face or hitting them in the knees or pricking them with a pin or talking to them, all forbidden. You couldn't do any of that stuff. Then they also had these things called sprints, and sprints were just as grueling as grinds, but they yielded quicker, more dramatic, and therefore more audience-enticing results. And a typical program for a show in which the contestants had danced for more than like a thousand hours, that's about 41 days, folks. Here was like a weekly schedule for this. On Monday, folks, we're going to sprinkle the dance marathon with zombie treadmills. Zombie treadmills. Zombie treadmills. And they lasted an hour long. What do you think a zombie treadmill is? And then I'll explain it. Oh, my God. 
whoever falls, you just have to start eating their flesh while walking. That's actually kind of a better idea than what I have. Zombie treadmills involved blindfolded contestant teams, often chained or tied together, racing one another. And this was one of the most popular sports in the dance marathon. You know why I got that mixed up? Because that's usually my Wednesday thing I do. But this is Monday you're talking Uh, about. Oh, well, Wednesday was elimination lap races. and Uh, And that was only for the male contestants. The day before, though, you could do figure eight races where you had to do 25 laps of figure eights in a row. Thursday, dynamite sprints. I I feel like that's where they blow you up at some point. Friday was heel and toe derbies. Saturday was elimination races, but for the female contestants. And then you would end with elimination time. Your rest period goes from 15 minutes to three minutes. They would do a rapid change of the music, always energetic. And you have to keep moving. And whoever was left standing, usually that would be like the top three couples. They won. If you literally were the fourth couple and you dropped out a second before the third couple, you didn't get anything, even though you had been dancing pretty much the same amount of time. Now, there's a lot of criticism about these dance marathons. Really? Are you shocked? Are you shocked? Hmm, Okay. Who do you think was the group that wanted to end the dance marathons more than anybody? The suffragettes. Oh, okay. Okay. Even though I guess I was years after. Well, no, okay, no, women were involved. Women were involved. Women's groups found charging strangers to watch humans being degrading abhorrent. And so they were like, you need to stop that. Churches were angry on moral grounds because there's like, you guys aren't dancing. This is full on body hugging in public. Huh. But more than those two groups, movie owners, movie owners were angry because their theaters were empty. They're like, they're going to watch dance marathons they're not coming to watch movies anymore so these three groups literally led huge movements for city ordinances saying you can't have dance marathons we're banning them there's nothing better than a good movement agreed and then two things happen which give these critics some validity to their statements there's a woman in seattle and she completed uh, a 19 day dance marathon and she only placed fifth And so she attempted to kill herself. Wow. And Seattle is like, oh boy. And so they ban dance marathons in Seattle. And then in Boston in the 1920s, there was this very healthy 27-year-old man named Homer Morehouse. And Homer danced for 87 hours straight and then collapsed from exhaustion and died on the dance floor. How many 87? 87 hours. Dance marathons then, with all this crap going on, start to fade away. One, people are dying. (laughs) That's not a good thing. The municipal ordinances that are just being issued everywhere, they keep closing them down. And if the big cities can't do them, these dance marathons go to like seedier parts of these states to do them. But then nobody wants to go to these seedier parts (laughs) to see the dance marathons. So they start to fade away. But also a couple of other big things happen. One, the economy begins to recover. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to go out and humiliate yourself to make money anymore. Thank you, FDR. Thank you, FDR. And then a bunch of the men who would be dancing in these dance marathons, they have to go fight in World War II. And if you were going to the dance marathon to see, like to take pleasure out of all these different storylines and stuff, You have radio now, and you start to have soaps on Mm -hmm. radio, and you have soaps on television, right? And in showers. And in showers. That's really a big one. So dance marathons really fell by the wayside. People didn't really do them anymore. And then in 1969, a movie gets released. And the movie is called They Shoot Horses, Don't They? And it stars Jane Fonda and Bruce Dern. Now, you might think this was a movie about equestrian abuse. It's not. A horse is a term from the dance marathon days. And so each major promoter had a stable of dancers he could count on to carry his event. So that's where the term horses comes from. This movie sort of gets dance marathons back into the public forum and public discussion. Here's a little clip or a little trailer from They Shoot Horses, don't they?
So have you seen this? Oh, yeah. This movie used to play on FX all the time. And I remember watching it, and I, I thought to myself, it was so inhumane. I thought it was something that was just made up. And then I realized, no, actually, this is what was going on. And it was probably 10 times worse than how the movie is displaying it. Well, Bruce Dern makes anything better. Bruce Dern really does make any, anything better. That's what I've always said. Now, here's what's interesting is, is when that movie comes out, colleges all over the United States are going through like a 1930s craze because it's retro. So things like the Marx Brothers are starting to come back. And the dance marathons are starting to come back. But they're like the movie portrays dance marathons as so inhumane why are we bringing it back and then somebody has a, a couple of people have really brilliant ideas is, which is well instead of dancing for an unlimited time let's put time limits on it let's make it more humane 60 days 60 <laughs> days and let's raise money for charity so colleges all over the united states start to do dance marathons but for charity purposes one of the most famous comes from Penn State University, oh. my alma mater, which in 1973 does something called THON, T-H-O-N, and that's a 46-hour dance marathon, which takes place every February at Penn State to raise money to combat children's cancer. And in 2020, they raised $11 million. So, so dance marathons essentially now have been repurposed for good. Yes, that is absolutely correct. Dance marathons have been repurposed for good. And it's so interesting to think about how important these dance marathons were for some people. Here's a little story that I'd like to share. There is a gentleman by the name of Callum DeVillier from Minnesota, and he was a hairdresser. And he designed his own headstone before his death. And this is what he put on his headstone. This is how this man wanted to be remembered by the world. DeVillier, world champion marathon dancer, 3,000. 780 continuous hours. That's 157 days. This man was in a dance marathon for 157 days. And of all the things he could have put as his epitaph, the thing he wanted the world to remember him the most for was that he danced for 157 days. Now, this is a little sad. He was in the Guinness Book of World Records, but they changed the rules of what exactly constitutes continuous dancing, and he is no longer in the Guinness Book of World Records, just his headstone in Minnesota. So it goes to show you how important being in these dance marathons were for some people, like good old Callum de Villiers. Do you know how old he was when he died? I do not know, but based on an article that I read, I saw that uh, Callum de Villiers died on day 140 of the dance marathon. <laughs> but in true American spirit, fine stock from Minnesota, he went for 17 more days. With a dog chain around his neck. <laughs> With a dog chain around his neck and the depression nipping at his heels. The Germans on the right, the French on the left, and Callum de Villiers, who just never settled down, who never found the right woman. <laughs> when we come back. We're going to talk more about the legacy of these dance marathons in the 21st century. This was a thing, this was a thing. And now, this is a sketch. And welcome back to our 118. Yes, that's right, folks. 118. Our 118 of the Iowa City, Kansas Dance Marathon. We started at 93 couples, and we are down to the final two pairs. We have Ruby, not too hot to Foxtrot McEnany, with her beau, Rodney Bloodstumps Gertzhorn. Rodney got his nickname Bloodstumps during this competition, actually. That's right, we call him Bloodstumps because he actually danced his feet right off. And all that remains are bloody stumps. Doctors cauterized his wounds, and he's icing them as much as possible on the 15-minute breaks. Most people are resting up while he is making sure not to lose another pint of blood. You gotta give a lot of credit to his partner, Ruby, not too hot to Foxtrot McEnany. For such a petite gal, she has the upper body strength of a great gray ox, being able to hold up old blood stumps and keep incredible rhythm. The two of them have knocked out couple 
Bull after couple. Truly a sight to be seen. Not too hot, the Foxtrot said she expected something like this to happen during the competition. That's why she would start off her days with three eggs and 15 push-ups every morning. That's right. When I sat down with her before the competition, she said, and I quote, I don't care if the fella can dance. I just want to win that new Westinghouse icebox. The Westinghouse icebox will come in handy for old blood stumps, swollen bloody stumps after this competition. Let's get to our second pair of finalists. That's right. Our final pair are the winners of the last seven competitions. Jeremiah Smith and his recently deceased mother, Mrs. Scarlett Beauregard Pepperton Smith. She went to her reward in the first round of this competition. And let's hope that Jeremiah can go to his reward in the final round of this competition. They're looking to add an eighth Westinghouse icebox to their collection. That Westinghouse icebox will come in handy when it comes to storing his late great mother. All right, time to take a break. Looks like blood stumps may be fading in and out of consciousness. We'll let you know what is happening after this word from our sponsor, Westinghouse Iceboxes. Thank you. This was a sketch. All right, so now that we're back, Ray, what are your thoughts on these dance marathons and do you also think that there's a connection between what everyone is obsessed with now which is reality television and what these dance marathons were doing almost 100 years earlier i absolutely see a uh, connection and i would absolutely pull out a quarter to watch one of these dance marathons do you think that there could be a reality tv show today in which it is hey we're dancing for as long as you can stay on this dance floor. I feel like it'd have to be like a special that a TV network did. I mean, if it was for charity, I feel like... No, 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 no. This is... It's it's a reality show. Whoever stays on the floor the longest will win the money. And we will go for however long that possibly happens. Well, to be honest, nowadays, I think that that actually probably could work with the sense that, yes, they could do an edited down one hour version. But then there would also be... There could be a YouTube live stream that people could tune into. A network could be doing a 24-hour feed of it. So I feel like with the shit that people watch, and I am one of those fucking people, I love bad reality i feel like this could probably be done do you think they could operate with the same rules like hey your knees touching the floor i'm gonna hit you i don't think i mean i don't think they could hit but i think there would definitely be a three strikes rule i don't think they could torture these people okay and now here's my other question for you back when they were doing these dance marathons a doctor could not remove someone from the dance floor the person had to leave voluntarily so what happens when somebody on this new reality show is starting to look like they're not doing too well. Can a doctor say you have to leave? Or do they stay with the old rules? There wouldn't be a doctor. There would be that one casted, like, secondary judge or host that it's like, all right, let's go to Becky J. Let's send Becky J onto the dance floor. Kelsey Q. Kelsey Q is on the dance floor with someone whose knee just talked. All right, straight to you, Kelsey. Someone whose knee just talked? Someone whose knee just touched. Oh, someone whose knee just touched. I thought they were going through hallucinations and they're like, Kelsey, what's going on out there? Well, I love being in the desert with these talking animals. No, you're on the dance floor in Culver City. I think I may be going through hallucinations. So just for our our, our listeners, <laughs> Rob actually wanted us to make it seem like this is a real thing. So we were actually on hour 27 of doing this. So it's actually very exciting. Oh, oh, and he's down. He's down. Ray has been disqualified. You said this is my 11. <laughs> Ray, is, Ray has been disqualified. <laughs> the one thing I really love about these dance marathons is a lot of people today have grandparents that I think are like living in their 90s and stuff, or parents who are living up to their 90s. Like, How did they do it? How did they do it? And when, t- when they're called the greatest generation, you're like, they really are the greatest generation. They survived a depression. They survived a dust bowl. They survived World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War. And now Trump. And Trump. <laughs> and they survived these dance marathons yeah. and they were like our life is horrible we have no money we have no food what do you want to do for fun all right let's see if i can dance for 300 hours tell me do i get an apple you do do i get 12 apples oh now you're pushing it <laughs> okay okay i'll stop with the one let's go so the reason that dance marathons for us are a thing like we said before is they were a perfect way i think of encapsulating the spirit of of Americans at that time, which is we will fight to do anything possible to keep ourselves fed, clothed, and to have a little money in our pocket. And they really created what people would be interested in a hundred years later with reality television. They're telling, they're giving you a template. 
They are actually giving you a template. Hey, make sure you have a couple that does this. Make sure you have a crazy person. Make sure you have someone who does that. Make sure you have an MC. They literally have created a template for well, us. Well, I did a little research on it, and I found an old one, and then at the bottom it said Lisa Renna. So it makes sense. Yeah, so oh, they really yeah. are following the yeah. template. Yeah, hey, you know what I think it's time for? Hmm. A game. Okay. This was a thing, and now it's a quiz. This is a This Was a Quiz. Mark Schroeder. Dance marathons, baby. You know, I think about Thon uh, admission. I never danced in Thon at Penn State. It was a huge really? part of Penn State. I never actually danced. I raised money in other ways, but I never did the dance marathon. Remember how all the kids, they used to drink. They used to buy like, remember like $200 worth of beer, and then they were going to recycle the beer cans and donate yeah, that to the kids. this is our contribution. And you would see people like just drunk and wasted, and you're like, What's FTK yeah. for the kids. And I was like, you've spent more money on beer. Yeah. And then you have on donating it to the kid. <laughs> All right, take it away. Absolutely. Well, unfortunately, even though I never danced in in Thon, I d- later in life had an appreciation for dance. I was a little apprehensive. Never been a big dancer. You guys, big dancers? No, if the, I'm a horrible the music, dancer. Yeah, horrible dancer. If the music turns on, right? What do you do? You dance or no? You, can you feel a beat? Am I alone? And do I have tap shoes on? Yes and yes. So then, oh yeah, I'm going for okay, it. Okay, now you're in public and you have slippers on. No. Oh, okay. yeah, I run. Hey, dance like no one's watching. Don't you read yearbooks? Yeah, but everyone's watching me. I, I would do a dance marathon now. I've become very comfortable with dancing, and uh, I've had made my peace with dancing. I have an appreciation for dance. Do you go to clubs when like clubs are open, like on a Friday night? No, like- I don't go to clubs, but like if you go to a bar, if I've, I've the circle of friends I found myself in with the last 10 years out here in LA are very uninhibited. We're not good dancers, but when the music's playing... I bet you're a much better dancer than you think you are. The problem is the I'm so tall, I'm 6'5", that you see me standing out literally amongst everybody else. So that made me self-conscious before. But then you just got to literally dance like I bet you're a much watching. better dancer than you think you are. Can you pop and lock? Uh, I can I can lock. I'm working on the pop. Okay. But I got the lock <laughs> locked in. A lot of pop issues I've been having. We'll work on your pop later. But we're going to find out what you two guys know about dance right now in a little game called I Just Gotta Dance. <laughs> Great. How many how many C's are in that word dance thing? <laughs> it's a lot of it's a, a little snake set it. <laughs> sibling, sibling. I'm gonna ask a series of questions related in some way to dance or dancing. Okay. You two are gonna work together to come up okay. with the correct answer. This is collaborative because it can get a little bit difficult. Give me my dancers over 40 baseball cap. <laughs> Let's yeah. see how well I Take do. That oh my off God. your knees <laughs> and luck. get ready to ask some questions. He has won two Best Supporting Actor Oscars in the past 11 years for movies by the same writer-director. And dance is involved in this? Dance is involved in this. His name, one of his names, is a form of dance. Oh. Well, who's who's Best Supporting Actor Oscars in the past 11 years? Yes, I will give you a hint. The writer-director has a penchant for F-word. Quentin Tarantino. What movies did Quentin Tarantino? Christoph Waltz. Yes, correct. Oh, Christoph that's, Waltz. damn it. Good job. Now you guys are in. Now you're locked in. Now you're locked in. Here we go. This form of dance originating in Jamaica involves the male dancer ramming his crotch area into the female dancer's buttocks and other forms of frantic sexual movements. Not dirty dancing. There's D's involved, but it's not dirty dancing. Wait, are you joking? Or is like, is it I'm dead be- serious. It begins it's with not a D. A D's nuts. It begins with a D. It's not D's nuts. The, this form of dancing begins with the letter D. This is a verb that happens in Romeo and Juliet. Dueling? No, um, but it's related to stabbing. But with a D and a particular weapon. Dagger? Daggering. Daggering, daggering is aggressive, sexual. Look up some I, YouTube videos. Check out daggering. It's I outrageous. I had no idea that was a thing. It's fun. The kids are doing it. <laughs> In the 1984 film Footloose, Kevin Bacon's character Ren learns that dancing has been banned in his town, thanks largely to Reverend Moore, played by this actor. John Lithgow. Yes. In addition to the electric slide, you may also have performed this slide at weddings, named after a popular Cuban dance. The cha-cha slide. The cha-cha slide is correct. What was unleashed upon the general public during the Motown 25 Yesterday Today Forever telecast on May 16th, 1983? Moonwalk. The moonwalk is correct. In the 1999 cover of Mambo Number no. 5, this artist claimed that a little bit of Rita's all I need. Lou Bega. Lou Bega is correct. I love Lou Bega. Uh. <laughs> what type of dance would you see Mr. Bojangles perform? The old soft shoe. Correct. I knew a man, Bojangles, and he danced for you. The old soft shoe. This sitcom star got their start in the music video for the 1984 Bruce Springsteen hit Dancing in the Dark. Courtney Cox. Yeah. Correct. This 2015 sequel 
finds Channing Tatum and his male stripper buddies on a road trip in a Froyo van. XXL, baby. Yeah, baby. Not even. I don't even need that first one. We know we all we all know. Magic it. Mike. And finally, this Brazilian martial art is known as dance fighting. Jiu-jitsu. Incorrect. Brazilian martial arts. Oh. Uh, key. Um, um. It is a C name. It is a C name. Capoeira. Capoeira. Isn't that a big? Isn't that a big rodent? Oh, that's capybara. capybara. <laughs> it's capybara, folks. Well, that's a big dancing rodent. Well, aside from the div- the capoeira and daggering, <laughs> you all know your. Uh, but I'll tell you, you what. Dance. I knew daggering. Yeah. Well. You didn't want to admit it. I'm wondering how long you, you could dance. How long do you think you can dance for, right? Some of these people went for like 127 days. How long do you think before you'd have to stop? I mean, there's 15-minute breaks, right? Yeah. In three hours. Great. Okay. <laughs> All right, friends. Keep dancing. Keep smiling. Keep shining. Keep on. Keep on. Keep on. Look at you, Brady Bunch. I love you. See you on the dance floor. Thanks for listening to This Was a Thing, and a big thanks to the folks that keep this show running. Our editor, Daniel Cut Cut Schwartzberg, our composer, Billy Better Than DC Reese, our social media director, Gabe Hashtag Crawford, our graphic designer, Natalie's Nothing Too Graphic De Savia, and finally, our games coordinator, Mark the Shark Schroeder. If you liked what we did today, make sure to head on over to iTunes to rate and review us. The more stars you leave us, the more love we feel. Hey, speaking of love, show us some social media love. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at This Was A Thing Pod and Facebook we are This Was A Thing Podcast. Reach out. We'd love to hear from you. And if you really liked what we did today, head on over to Patreon.com and become one of our sponsors and you'll get access to special episodes, interviews, and merch. That's Patreon. Search This Was A Thing and support us so we can keep doing this show. 